So I want to talk today about some uh, statistical approaches to PDE inverse problems. Uh, we'll introduce a little gallery of examples that sort of motivate uh, the work and, and, and sit behind uh, various results that we'll discuss. And uh, we'll, we'll um, talk about, I'll, I'll kind of give an overview of, of how I see, see this uh, emerging field, which I think has a lot of really exciting opportunities for uh, analysis and also in computation. And we'll talk about results we have in terms of Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms and uh, concerning consistency. So uh, I should acknowledge a wonderful little group of collaborators. Justin Kremitis is my former PhD student. He just got a, a professorship at Virginia Tech, which I'm very happy and excited for him for, very well deserved. And uh, some of you may know Cecilia Mondaini, who was um, also here as a postdoc and is now tenure track at Drexel and our colleague, Jeff Beauregard. So um, let me start with the main uh, motivating uh, problem or problem that will come up multiple times during the talk, uh, which is the recovery of a, a divergence-free vector field or the estimation of a div divergence-free vector field from the observation of a solute that's passively invected by this velocity field and is diffusing. Um, hey, uh, Nathan, um, yes. your, your screens or your slides are not advancing. They're not advancing? Oh boy, okay. Uh, let me try again. I'm glad somebody said something. What is going on? Is it, can you see them now? No, no. Um, we only see all of our faces, not. All right. Not I find either. Acrobat is not good. So let me change to, this is embarrassing. But let me change to, uh, you'll give me one second here. Oh, okay. It's right here. Okay, let's try again. Let's try again. Let's try again. Uh, view. Okay, and let's see if I can share. All right, I'm sharing this. Can you see it? Can everybody see? Yes. And the thing is, sometimes it's not happy when I enter full screen. How about now? Are you seeing as I'm advancing? Yes. Okay. Better? Yes. See forward, backwards? All right. So, um, so uh, okay. So maybe we understand the problem, though. Uh, you're essentially dropping dye in a, in a glass of water. Uh, you get to observe the concentration of the dye at sparsely at some points in space and time. It's being evicted somehow and it's diffusing and you wanna recover as much as information as you can about the underlying uh, velocity field. I found as I've given this talk a few times recently, overall encompassed in our framework, we, you could make it more complicated than this, but usually we'll be thinking about the two-dimensional setting and we're assuming the velocity field usually is time independent. But anyway, from having sparsely observed this solute, we want to ask how much information we can recover, and subject to observational noise in our in our in our observations, we want to see the extent to which we can recover some information about our velocity field. So I'll just quickly scroll through a couple of other um, uh, ill-posed inverse problems motivated by fluid measurement. Uh, this is a second problem which we're really starting to consider seriously, although I won't say much more about it uh, further on in the talk which is the recovery of a um, the, uh, boundary shape from observation of say a Stokes flow in the, uh, in the bulk in, in various ways. So the, the flow is being uh, rotated on the outer boundary and there's some kind of unknown shape of the inner boundary. So we're observing something about say at some, some, some measurement points in the bulk or some, some uh, uh, volume average uh, measurements of the flow, we want to uh, make some inference about the shape of the boundary, inner boundary. Here's, here's another problem sort of on our agenda, which would be to estimate the bottom heating profile in a Rayleigh-Bernard convection problem. I'm framing it here in the infinite Prandtl setting, so we're only worried about uh, the, the temperature measurements and so that we have a nice well-posed problem. Um, but again, so you have uh, convection, 
it's being heated from below, cooled above, um, and you want to and you want to having observed, let's say the, the temperature field somewhere in some some uh, spots in the bulk. Uh, make some inference about what's going on for the bottom boundary heating, what, what, the, what the heating profile is on the bottom boundary. And I'll just mention several other problems that are sort of interest in the field recently. One is uh, sort of unknown potentials in a, uh, a Schrodinger problem, a stationary Schrodinger problem. So the V being the unknown from observing the solution U. Um, you can consider the question of unknown um, diffusion coefficients. So in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in an elliptic problem. And then this uh, data assim assimilation context, which you hear about a lot where the uh, uh, initial condition is unknown and you, you observe the solution at some forward time and you wanna, you wanna make some inference about what, where, the, where, the, where the process, where the, where the equation was in the, in the past. Although this last problem will often take a, a sort of different form in, in terms of computational limits. But once again, we have our solution that we're observing, and we have some parameters that we'd like to make some inference on that are uh, infinite dimensional. And will you excuse me one second? My, uh, my phone is making a loud noise. OK. I apologize. Okay, so, so, okay, so we have a sort of ill-posed unifying these different problems. We have sort of an ill-posed inverse problem. In effect, you're observing y, and you'd like to uh, basically invert g, which is uh, a, a map from some parameters involved with a PDE to these uh, sparse observations. Of course, you're not going to be able to invert G. Um, and so you can treat this as a Bayesian question. Um, you can form a likelihood function and you, you, you add the additional assumption that your um, uh, observed data is subject to some, some sort of observation noise. So you can write down a likelihood function. And by putting a prior on your unknown parameters, you can in effect uh, write down what u given y is, which takes this product form prior times uh, likelihood, and you get a, a, a solution, your, your posterior, which is a sort of, sort of comprehensive model of your uncertainty in your unknown parameter. Um, so I think unifying all these different examples that I, that I put in front of you um, is the fact that you want your unknown parameter to sit actually in an infinite dimensional uh, space. It's an unknown function, an unknown velocity field, unknown boundary shape, et cetera, et cetera, and these different uh, problems I've described. So writing down a, the Bayes theorem in this sort of uh, infinite dimensional setting or general state space setting is really just a, an exercise in regular conditional probability that we have sort of in an appendix of one of our recent papers. and. Just th things like this can be found elsewhere. But the thing I want to point out is that indeed the parameters we are uh, observing are infinite dimensional and the, a good class of priors are given by uh, Gaussian measures where we have a very nice theory on Hilbert space or Banach space. And um, so there, there are various reasons that will appear as we go throughout the talk that these are a desirable class of priors. And um, they, they, they have some, some, some physically reasonable uh, interpretations too in some of the models that we're discussing. Um, just to connect with sort of, uh, uh, sort of classical uh, inverse problem uh, approaches, um, you, you might say, well, I wanna uh, find a value of the parameter that most closely matches my data according to some loss function L. Uh, subject to some kind of soft constraint or regularization term. And so you're optimizing an objective functional. And in fact, the um, Bayesian approach sort of embeds this sort of classical, uh, maybe more classical setting as a, as a kind of uh, piece of the picture. So if I take my uh, loss function to be the log likelihood, and I take my uh, regularization term to be the log prior, then the, this, this, this minimizer would be the 
would be the map point or sort of the, the point of maximal probability according to the posterior measure. So there's sort of this, this Bayesian approach sort of uh, embeds this classical um, uh, optimization problem uh, uh, sort of inside of it. And this can be extended to infinite dimensions in a nice way uh, in the case where you use a Gaussian prior. Um, so the big operative question, this is going to be the first big theme for the talk, and what I think one of the things that I think makes this subject so interesting and rich is that you want to get observables from this posterior. You want to, you want to sort of get information out of it. You want to understand various correlations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, in simple sort of undergraduate terms, you've got the sort of numerical integration problem from hell, right? Um, we've got a high dimensional measure really infinite dimensional. Um, and you know, each grid point that we want to observe involves a, a PDE solve, right? So it's, it's very expensive and uh, challenging uh, thing to resolve these observables. Um, and so maybe one of, the, uh, one of the only solutions we have is this sort of sampling approach or Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, which is uh, very interesting, very attractive, which is that you, you, you you have your target measure and you come up with a Markov chain that holds this target measure that you that you want to that you want to resolve for us it's these Bayesian posteriors as an invariant and then you have the uh, hope and maybe uh, that you'll, you'll have some nice ergodic properties of this Markov chain with respect to the um, target measure namely uh, uh, the the uh, the, the, the Markov process or the Markov chain given by this, this kernel mixes to the uh, uh, desired uh, observable here. So this is uh, actually the initial thing that drew me to this subject because we're really thinking about now Markov kernels on uh, infinite dimensional spaces. And they're really nice connections in terms of coming up with good um, good kernels with uh, stochastic and Hamiltonian evolution equations in infinite dimensions for this subject. And we'll talk today about the uh, Metropolis uh, Hastings setup, which, which is also an integral part of um, uh, defining this sort of rich class of chains that, that, that allow you to computationally resolve these measures. Um, so the other, the other set of problems which I'd like to discuss with you are this sort of question of consistency. So I have a, I have a set of uh, posteriors and you talk to uh, your nice statistician friend around the department and they immediately ask you, well, is your, is your setup consistent? Namely, if I get more and more data in this case, if I have more and more observations of my solutions, um, <clears throat> do these measures concentrate around a true value of your parameter? And I think from a PDE point of view, maybe an applied math point of view, I think another thing that's worth saying here is that th this is sort of an experimental design question because, hey, uh, given you know a fixed number of observations, can I can I place my sensors? Can I set up my observations so that I have say uh, you know minimum minimum variance around my my end end parameter that sort of thing? So we have some initial results here that I'm also hope hoping to describe to you. Okay. So let me come to the first set of um, set of, uh, of, of detailed um, descriptions about some some results and some some this this Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. Um, so uh, uh, the 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 Metropolis Hastings idea is that well you have a I have this nice little video if I can animate it maybe I won't be able to now. Um, but basically, you have a target measure, which is uh, in some non-standard form, maybe. It's not one of your standard uh, probability measures. And so how do, you, how do you resolve this measure? How do you come up with a good Markov kernel? So you have a proposal mechanism that you, that you write down, that you, that, you, that you set up, where from, from wherever your current point is, you have, you have some probability distribution of your next point that you draw from. And um, this is not going to be invariant with respect to your target measure, but you can make it so by adding uh, an acceptance uh, mechanism, which is you flip a coin with a bias given by this, by this probability, which is uh, defined in terms of your current state and your proposed state. And if 
the coin lands heads, you go to the proposed state. And if it lands tails, you simply stay where you are. OK. Um, so just a few things about this acceptance probability. First thing to note is that the target measure, often the um, normalizing constant, which comes up in this sort of business, is cancels off as it comes as a ratio, which is a very important aspect of this. And just to get some intuition in the common case where your proposal kernel is symmetric, the cues here, they cancel off. And so if I go to a point of higher probability according to my target measure, then I simply go there. And if I go to a point of lower probability, I go there with a probability proportional to the relative probabilities between the two points. Okay, so the $64,000 question is, well, how do you come up with good proposal kernels? And one, one approach, which is maybe the oldest approach, is sort of cheap and cheerful approach. You simply uh, make, let's say, Gaussian proposals or some other reasonable distribution around your current point, and you let the metropolization do all the work to sort of resolve the shape of your target measure. But um, sort of more sophisticated approaches that began to be developed in the late 80s and 90s uh, re revolve around the idea that you can come up with stochastic dynamics and Hamiltonian dynamics that, um, uh, that hold your desired target measure as an invariant. And so by uh, discretizing these dynamical systems, you can come up with uh, very elegant proposal kernels. And the Metropolis uh, mechanism, the Metropolis-Hastings mechanism, is to create correct for bias that comes in um, that comes in um, the uh, uh, error from the numerical discretization, which is inevitable. Um, okay, so we're interested in these infinite dimensional uh, measures and a very nice series of works about uh, eight to 10 years back around Andrew Stewart's group, I was now at Caltech actually, um, uh, formulated versions of these three approaches uh, in an infinite dimensional setting. And the, the, sort of, the sort of philosophy here is, well, if we can define these um, methods at the infinite dimensional level, then when you inevitably sort of discretize your, 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 um, your uh, MCMC scheme to a to finite dimensional truncation of your parameter, um, your, uh, the mixing rates that you would, you would hope you would expect that you would hope for, that is the number of samples that you would need to take to resolve your measure should be independent of uh, how far uh, you uh, how far you truncate your your parameter space to finite dimensions. Okay, and so uh, in this case of a Gaussian prior, which gives you a, a certain linear structure in 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 all three of these cases, um, a mixture of uh, careful preconditioning and uh, the let's say being more careful about how you uh, carry out numerical discretizations of these different dynamical systems yield, uh, yield MCMC schemes that are, that are well-defined on infinite dimensional spaces. So I'm going to zoom in on these schemes. And then um, we'll see that we have a result that somehow provides a unified picture of these different schemes under one sort of, uh, under, under one sort of theorem and provides for other means of deriving other uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo schemes, which is sort of topic of current work. All right, so let me zoom in. So the, the first approach is what people call PCN, or what I guess is labeled PCN, which stands for preconditioned Crank-Nicholson scheme. Crank-Nicholson refers to the discretization of an orenstein uhlenbeck process, which holds the prior, which is a Gaussian measure here with uh, trace class covariance C. And so um, uh, you can write down, uh, based on um, some results of Tierney, a, uh, uh, a accept-reject mechanism for this, for this case. So it's, it's you know, quite, quite easy to uh, implement, and it's a nice uh, approach. Um, but this MALA approach, which is, I think, in some ways an unfortunate uh, uh, terminology, but it stands for Metropolis Adjusted Langevin Algorithm, um, uh, uh, incorporates uh, this, 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 this gradient term of the, of the potential, which for us is log likelihood. And so again, you take a, a Crank-Nicholson discretization, at least of the linear piece, 
And uh, so here, the target measures uh, can be shown to be invariant even in this infinite dimensional setting. And you can write down this, this uh, an appropriate metropolis, uh, metropolization to uh, avoid um, bias. But just to zoom in on the trade-off here, so this results in the requirement that you need to compute the gradient of your, of your, um, of your potential, of your likelihood function. And so this, 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 is, uh, this, this is a great additional complication, um, even, if it, even if this algorithm takes into account the shape of your target measure. Because each direction that you want to compute the gradient, at least naively, looks like a separate PDE solve. Um, luckily, uh, we learned about these uh, adjoint methods that you can develop, which is essentially a realizing that you can integrate by parts. So uh, computing this integral against a single solve of this adjoint equation and noticing that this, this equation is sort of the adjoint of that equation, you can, you can, um, you can integrating by parts, uh, see that this guy is equivalent to this guy. But still, you've added all this additional complexity. And each time I want to, um, I want to evaluate a gradient. I I need to uh, carry out two additional PDE solves. All right. So let me let me zoom in on this final algorithm, which is something that really uh, we've uh, is a beautiful idea that goes back to um, uh, Duane and collaborators in the late 80s and was brought into the statistics community by Neil, which is that. Uh, which starts from the observation that the Gibbs measure, e to the minus Hamiltonian, is an invariant for uh, Hamiltonian, an invariant measure for the Hamiltonian associated Hamiltonian dynamics. So I've written my target measure here in a finite dimensional setting. And if I consider this as a sort of e to the minus potential, I consider the potential as a potential energy in an artificial, in a Hamiltonian associated with an artificial Hamiltonian system. Uh, I, it's natural to consider uh, this, you know, quadratic kinetic uh, energy uh, piece, and so um, you the the uh, the the momentum uh, marginal of this Gibbs measure is a Gaussian measure I can sample from. The position marginal is my desired target measure, so I draw from the uh, I draw from the um, uh, momentum piece. I have my current position. I run forward my Hamiltonian dynamics. I get a new position, and then I reset over and over and over again. And that gives me a Markov chain and gives me a means of sampling from my target measure. Um, the numerical discretization that's inevitable for these systems is, is very uh, delicate. And you begin to realize you need a, uh, a symplectic or at least volume preserving um, uh, scheme. The, to discretize uh, equation three here. And the reversibility is, is probably the most important property that if I run forward uh, the dynamics, flip the uh, momentum, and then run forward the dynamics again, I end up back where I started. This is a property that you learn about in your, in your Hamiltonian dynamics class. And that's crucial in your numerical discretization that it's preserved in your numerical discretization. But having done that, you, 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 can, you can derive a uh, metropolis, um, uh, metropolis, an acceptance probability that's the difference of the Hamiltonians. And it, this has a different structure than the previous examples, which involves not just the current state and the uh, proposed state, but also these axillary momenta. OK. Um, so, uh, once again, uh, around this work of Beskos et al., there's an infinite dimensional version that was derived, uh, which is, uh, involves considering a sort of position velocity formulation or a precondition formulation of this uh, dynamics and a very particular splitting of the Hamiltonian. So, uh, we wanted, we, we started to think about whether um, this effective dynamics could be replaced with some sort of lower order approximation of the um, of the of this of this of this gradient of the uh, potential piece uh, that I'm let's see let me just highlight it here um, and we realized that that sort of following formally what the 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 proofs in, in this work that led to um, that led to uh, the the uh, the reversibility or 
and in consequence invariance of the scheme would sort of work, but we didn't really understand the mechanisms well. And they were not transparent. There was sort of a magical cancellation of infinities in this particular splitting. And uh, the, the, basically the setting of the metropolization and how this is formulated was a little mysterious, including a, a, a sort of a spectral approximation argument. So um, this led us down a rabbit hole from a pr sort of practical question of like how we could uh, derive new algorithms that in the end um, uh, gave us a sort of, we ended up with a grand unified picture of uh, these metropolis algorithms that sort of under one single theorem uh, uh, yields or re reveals all of these uh, algorithms that I've described to you as a special case. So let me try to uh, uh, take you slowly through our, our recent theorem here, um, which is formulated on very general state spaces, just measurable spaces. You have a target measure, which is on a measurable state space X, and you have this auxiliary space, uh, which you might want to think of as the momentum space Y. And there are two ingredients to defining any, any one of these algorithms, which is that you have a, um, a, a momentum proposal kernel, which for every point in X gives you a distribution in Y. And you have an involution, uh, which is a map from X cross Y into X cross Y, such that if you iterate the map twice, you're back where you started. So you can think of that as being related to this reversibility condition in the Hamiltonian dynamics. And so from your current position, you draw from this um, momentum kernel V, you map the position and momentum X and, or am I referring it to Q and V uh, forward? Uh, and then you form this acceptance uh, ratio, which, which involves uh, the push forward of M uh, with respect to M as a, as a radon nicodyme derivative. And uh, that, that gives you your acceptance probability for the new state. And you can think of M as being a sort of generalized, uh, generalized Gibbs measure, this compound measure M. And you can think of, um, you can think of, uh, you can think of this uh, alpha hat as involving this difference in e to the minus difference in the Hamiltonians, which appeared earlier. OK. So that's the statement of our theorem. And uh, under this algorithm, um, uh, u is reversible with respect to the, uh, uh, the, under this kernel that we've formulated, u is reversible and therefore invariant. Okay, so this recovers all of the classical algorithms under appropriate parameter choices, uh, and including a number of more uh, complicated so-called geometric methods uh, due to Girolami Calderhead, and it recovers all of the uh, algorithms that I've that I've uh, placed in front of your eyeballs, PCN model and HMC as special cases. Uh, parameter choices. And we're able to develop, and I'll show this to you on the next slide, a sort of um, single algorithm that under specific parameter choices yields all of these different, um, all of these different uh, methods. Um, <clears throat> so we, we have uh, 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 Andrew Holberg, actually, at, who's at UCLA, who just arrived fairly recently, someone to check out as a kind of silent uh, 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 fourth co-author gave us a lot of wonderful uh, references in the literature uh, in an early draft that we circulated to him. Um, so we didn't realize this, but there was a, there was a, a wider prehistory to, to this subject, which was kind of surprising to us. We thought we would sort of discovered the, the wheel and it, it wasn't quite that. But uh, so this, this falls out as a special case, or a special case of our algorithm can also be said to be the so-called Metropolis-Hastings-Green algorithm, which was surprising to us, had not been connected until quite recently to the um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo setup. But this is sort of a, uh, a specific uh, finite dimensional uh, continuous distribution uh, 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 setting. Um, Okay, and so and 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 I guess we we had in mind to derive a, a, a surrogate trajectory method, which which seems to be new for this infinite dimensional context, but had some earlier prehistory in the sort of machine learning literature again in, in finite dimensions. Uh, 
So here's our algorithm. When I take f to be the grade uh, c times the gradient, c being the the covariance operator of the um, of 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 the uh, base measure, Gaussian base measure is is uh, and and appropriate choices for our time steps and so on yields uh, the uh, infinity HMC. But under another uh, parameter choice, uh, simply taking f zero uh, or taking an, a certain number of steps, we we get uh, Mala and and PCN. Actually, one thing that's and and so this is a basis of 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 formulating all sorts of lower order uh, approximate gradient methods, surrogate trajectory methods for these infinite dimensional problems, which we're currently experimenting with. I'll mention too that if uh, it, it explained a funny bug that we could never explain, which is I'll show you some numerics in a little bit. And Justin, my wonderful collaborator, um, was running some numerics that was like getting the correct statistics, but somehow seemed to be going incredibly slowly. And it turned out that he had somehow for HMC, and it turned out that somehow he had just turned off accidentally. He finally fixed it. His um, his his gradient piece in his in his numerics somehow it got got uh, shut off. So he was computing the right statistics and just and just uh, uh, kind of by accident. Okay, so I'll just say a word about this algorithm. I guess I have maybe twenty another half an hour. Is that about right or twenty minutes? Yes, we started let's, say, let's say 20, 25 minutes. Okay, I just kind of want to calibrate where I am. So I'll just say just say a word about this. I mean, once you realize the right formulation, the proof is quite quite elegant and simple, just a page maybe, and you see the role of the uh, of the of the um, involution here. Um, and it was really an exercise in in in, in finding the right framing and learning how to do sort of cal calculus with push forwards. You can see basically in order to establish this detailed balance condition that you need to uh, maintain this equality, the second term in, in, the, in the metropolis type kernel is, uh, maintains the detailed balance in an obvious fashion. And you can see the role that having this, this, this in, in, involutive structure plays in uh, essentially um, uh, uh, calculating that you, you, get, you, get, you get this invariance. All right, so I, I want to I want to say I'll leave that there, and I want to turn to describe some numerics that we've done to you. Um, so, uh, by the way, I'll say that this came previously to the result I just uh, uh, described. So we're only going to be looking at HMC and PCN. We also did Mala um, to be announced or to 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 come sometime in the future on these surrogate trajectory methods with these with these examples that we're running. Um, but we wanted to run some comprehensive numerics. Um, one of the things was we knew these algorithms were in theory um, should work, but it's, it's, it's actual efficacy on a, on a problem, whether it could resolve complex structures, et cetera, et cetera, in reasonable time was unclear. Um, so we wanted to come up with some examples that would have some, some multi-weld complex structure. Uh, I, I'd say in the end, we end up with some complex correlation structure more than maybe multi-weld, but um, the, way we, the way we formulated this um, regarding our prior, so we're back to this, I, I should say this, this advection diffusion problem. We're trying to recover the velocity field, and we looked at some initial conditions where a certain and and some points of observation where the velocity field and its and and switching the direction of the velocity field would yield the same data as it were. Our prior is calibrated on a sort of uh, uh, onsets that you might see in turbulence, some kind of power law decay type structure in the in the covariance operator. And so when we set this up this way, um, we get a a, a, a posterior measure, as I've as I've formulated, and we want to see if these methods will actually resolve um, resolve the posterior. Um, just to say a few words about Justin's incredible numerics, and this was a really exciting opportunity to have some collaborators who could do some large scale uh, computations, uh, and so you kind of see the the scale of the of the of the 
uh, operation here. And we have all the, uh, uh, we have a, a very nice uh, code base for this, for this particular problem. Um, okay, and you can see the kind of level of the numerical uh, resolution of the problem and sort of some, some sense of the scale of uh, the time scale involved and the relative cost of PCM versus HMC. We have this little kind of representative uh, uh, diagram here with, you know, PCN, each sample is a sort of a single PDE solve, whereas HMC, you have uh, sort of tau over epsilon, where tau is the integration time and epsilon is sort of the time step size. And, uh, and we, we sort of focused on PCN and HMC. Malo was sort of all of the uh, all of the annoyance of implementation with none of the gain for um, uh, for for what we what we did. So I'll I'll, I'll leave that. And the first thing I want to comment is the, the remarkable thing is we can resolve these incredibly complicated, beautiful uh, correlation structures. So what you see here are the uh, components of the the Fourier components of the velocity field, looking at at, at sort of two dimensional uh, projections down to you know two components of the of the Fourier uh, along the diagonal. We just have the 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 um, probability uh, density of the computed of the of the individual Fourier modes. And uh, here's here's two point correlation structures for the for the vorticity field. Um, and you can, we also uh, did various other observables here is for the uh, one and two point statistics for the components of the velocity field. So you see in these measures, you have this like incredible, like this incredibly complex uh, uh, description of, of, of our sort of uncertainty and you can query it in any number of different ways. Um, and just to kind of compare the, the, the numerics, um, uh, and you can kind of see the, the different parameters we chose for PCN and HMC. On a per sample basis, HMC just, just blows PCN out of the water. If you, if you look at various things, these are the, uh, you can see that, you know, looking at traces of, of the individual Fourier modes, how it's sort of moving through the parameter space, autocorrelation functions, you can see this as a trace of the, um, of the likelihood function. And maybe this is very illustrative. So this is 150,000 samples of PCN versus HMC, right? And so you can see that we've we've sort of fully, almost fully resolved this this uh, I guess nine by nine grid with uh, 150,000 samples of HMC and PCN is just getting started, right? Um, and you can see the the uh, different uh, elements along the diagonal as well. But when you actually look at a sort of wall clock time uh, comparison, uh, we find it's kind of a wash. Uh, this is in this diagram, we're looking at the, we, we've computed the hell out of this thing. And we have a kind of true, um, a true, uh, a true mu, mu superscript y. And um, we're, we're computing the, the, the convergence of the total variation norms. Uh, as a function of time in these various in these various uh, two-dimensional uh, marginals, and you can see that there is sort of a wash. And in other other measurements that we made, when you actually take into account sort of wall clock time, it's sort of a, a wash. So more to come on this, but I think I think I think it's very valuable to see how these different algorithms work in practice. There's many algorithmic parameters, and there's a lot to be understood theoretically and. Um, I hope to sometime in the future be able to show you how, how these surrogate trajectory methods perform in comparative perspective. But okay, so, so one of my goals coming into this, like at the start that kind of drew me to the subject is, could we actually uh, prove some things uh, rigorously about these, about these convergences um, that we were sort of observing numerically? And uh, so, uh, you know, I been working over a number of years on, on these sort of issues for uh, SPDEs. And there's a lot of tools that you can bring to bear uh, for these, these kind of problems, it turns out. Um, so the first thing to, to mention is, OK, so you want to you want to prove a mixing mixing theorems. You want to sort of you know get bounds between these ergodic averages and the averages against the invariant measure, right? 
Um, but uh, so, so you might want to measure convergence in total variation distance, or that would be the classical approach. But since we're in infinite dimensions, or certainly high dimensional discretizations of infinite dimensional problems, you realize quickly that the total variation distance is a poor metric to use. Um, and instead, you actually want to use these sort of Washer-Stein distances, which uh, topologize, as it were, weak convergence. And there are very nice uh, frameworks for uh, so-called weak Harris theorems um, that give you that give you criteria for for establishing contraction in these in these metrics for 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 Markov chains on on general state spaces. Um, as a sort of simplifying initial uh, uh, foray into this into this topic into in, into this into this question, we we had a sort of um, and by the way I should say that um, in this last case this uh, infinite dimensional preconditioned HMC algorithm it was explicitly posed as an open problem in the in the in the original works can you prove uh, mixing properties for this algorithm. Is it possible to prove this? And as a, as a sort of initial idealization, and they, they, they consider this idealization in their, in their paper, you can consider what's so-called exact HMC, where you don't consider the numerical discretization. And you don't then, contrary to our earlier discussions, have to think yet about the, 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 the role of metropolization, which is in itself a a challenging question to understand as far as mixing is concerned. But in any case, with a sort of uh, spectral approximation approach, you can prove that this, that this preconditioned uh, uh, HMC uh, dynamic is, uh, holds your, your, your target measure or a class of target measures as, as invariant. So, uh, we were able to show uh, mixing results for these 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 classes of, uh, of these classes of Markov chains. Um, so our conditions are a uh, Hessian bound on what what for us would be in concrete problems the um, the uh, the likelihood function, and uh, uh, we get up to an integration time that's that's related to the to the uh, to the to our bound on the Hessian and the top eigenvalue of the uh, Gaussian prior, as it were, that the that the that this that this that this uh, chain, this algorithm, uh, uh, contracts exponentially in a certain weighted Wasserstein metric uh, that uh, accounts for um, the uh, sort of uh, large scale Lyapunov structure. So this is an actually whoops. This is an actually a distance function, but it's distance like, and it gives you. Uh, as we show, uh, enough to uh, prove a strong law of large numbers and central limit theorem type results. So basically, bounds on uh, bounds on the ergodic averages here um, that you would like. Um, <clears throat> one thing to comment on is that there's a lot of interesting PDE analysis, some of which is is still, uh, I think, you know, ongoing for us to get global bounds on the on the Hessian. Um, we we had to make some compromises with with the sort of measurements that we could uh, make, or we can actually get global bounds in the time stationary case. So there's a lot of like interesting PDE analysis that goes into. Uh, Showing that this that that these sort of conditions that that go into our theorem maybe they can be improved, um, but in any case uh, bounds that, that that would appear on the on the um, on the likelihood function involves some some serious PDE analysis in terms of the uh, likelihood function, which involves this forward map, which involves the the underlying PDE, which this is what I mean about coming back to the induction diffusion problem uh, we we verify. Uh, we're still thinking about the discretized met metropolis dynamics, and I think uh, there's opportunities here because of the way this uh, Wasserstein contraction works to quantify bias. And although I, I think that you can still think of this theorem as a sort of perturbation of the Gaussian case, a perturbation of this, of, 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 the, uh, of, of, of the Gaussian case in terms of a small time condition or a small potential condition. I think we've identified structural properties of the Hamiltonian dynamics that we'd like to have a better uh, sense of, which maybe at least 
reachable in some in some in some toy problems that I think these results can be refined and improved. So we have sort of a basis for thinking about that moving forward. Uh, okay. So I'll say a word or two about the about the uh, weak Harris theorem. So 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 basically, there's a couple of innovations here. One is realizing that you want to, uh, in fact, observe contraction in this in this in these Wasserstein metrics, and classically you would you would come up with a with an exact coupling between any two starting points of your chain, um, but uh, you can identify conditions and an appropriate. Uh, sort of notion of distance. So you can do contraction all at once and sort of avoid explicit coupling, uh, uh, explicit construction of explicit couplings, which is very Byzantine and hard to, to look at. But basically, you want to identify some Lyapunov structure at large scale. You want to identify an irreducibility property and some sort of local smoothing. And I think one of the takeaways of this work is sort of uh, identifying the, the, the mechanisms in, in Hamilton in, in our Hamiltonian system that would lead to these different properties. Remember that although the Hamiltonian system is so to speak energy preserving, there's a there's a uh, reset mechanism on the on the momentum piece. So this is what's giving us some Lyapunov structure that if if I'm at a high uh, uh, potential energy, some of that should be by the dynamics converted into kinetic energy, which is then reset at each step. So that's what's giving us some Lyapunov structure. That's sort of the basis for those sort of uh, those, those sort of uh, um, a, a, obtaining that sort of structure in this dynamic. Um, and with regard to uh, the irreducibility and the sort of quote unquote local smoothing, you have an interesting control problem uh, once again that can be described in terms of Hamiltonian systems, which is if I have two different initial conditions and one momentum specified for me, uh, how do I choose a second momentum so that the positions come close to one another after, after a, a certain length of time? And in this in the setup which we have, uh, a sort of uh, infinite dimensional, sort of a sort of nudging like foyish prote sort of structure can be identified. But I think there's 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 room for for a much deeper understanding of what, uh, and maybe again specific examples could be uh, responsible for a mechanism like this that leads, in essence, in the end to uh, irreducibility in this, in this problem. All right, so I think I have a couple minutes left, maybe, and I'll just say a few words about consistency, which has been another really nice uh, uh, topic for us. And so once again, we want to. Am I doing okay, Susan? Uh, you, are. you are. Another okay. five minutes. Okay, that's that's perfect. So um, so now we're going to say we're going to observe more and more. Um, we're going to get more and more data from this problem. Once again, we're we're back to our induction diffusion example. Um, and uh, as we get more data, we're going to have a sequence of posterior measures that we would hope would concentrate on a true value of our parameter. So we fix a true value of the parameter, we sample according to our statistical model for, for measurement, and we form our posterior measures and we hope that they concentrate. So there's, there's sort of, I would break the challenges for consistency up in the following way. First of all, we want to know whether sort of our observation procedure can recover the the true value of the solution theta, or at least enough of the true value of the sol solution theta. How is that occurring? Is there a sort of consistency, as it were, in the in the in the in, in our in our knowledge of theta from these posterior measures? Um, but we may have something, and this is this is just a structural. Uh, this is just structural in this problem that we're looking at. The map from the parameter to the PD solution may not be invertible. And in fact, it isn't in this problem. And if you think about stratifying, say, the initial condition, let's say, uh, I don't know, in the x direction, and then you think about the all velocity fields that are shear in the, the, the y direction, any shear velocity field with this initial condition is going to yield the heat equation as the solution. And so, so that you can't distinguish between all these different shear flows in this, in this example. And there's other uh, symmetries associated in this problem. So one has to think about 
you know, how one wants to formulate consistency around this sort of basic fact of this PDE um, or this, this problem. And at least this is my impression as a kind of amateur faraway statistician, fake statistician, there's a sort of, uh, when you, we talk about class, classical approaches to Bayesian consistency for Bayesian estimators or something, it's almost like the prior is this thing we're embarrassed about having around. But from our point of view, like the prior plays, a, it, it, and, and I, I think we kind of have a, a picture of this plays an indispensable role in actually recovering the true value of the parameter. So somehow the way we think about this is the prior and the data kind of working in tandem to, to recover the true value of the parameter. In essence, the prior should rule out ex extremely wild uh, uh, values for this true value of the parameter, uh, uh, I'm calling it U star. So let me walk you through this, this uh, statement of the theorem. So as I said, we, we are not going to be able to recover you from a single experiment theta. But what we find is if we have two different ways of dropping the dye in the fluid, as it were, in other words, if the uh, gradients of the, uh, let me say this correctly, at now 6.30 at night almost, the gradients of the um, initial conditions are, are uh, only collinear at most on a set of uh, measure zero. So we, 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 we run this experiment where we you know, look at two, two different initial conditions subject to this condition. And there are different observation procedures you could consider. Uh, I think this is generalized, can be generalized in certain directions, but we're drawing our observation points in the setup at, at random in space and time uniformly. And so that's how we gather our data. We have our true value of the parameter. We, 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 we oscillate between theta one and theta two, and we form these posterior measures. And um, now, now, now for the role of the, of the, uh, now for the role of the prior distribution, what it should do is uh, rule out, uh, rule out large tails. Um, so what that, what that adds up to, can you excuse me for two seconds? Something embarrassing with my clock in the back. That's the last time you'll hear of it. So anyway, we need to rule out that the, we need some sort of uniform um, tail condition on our posterior, uh, on our resulting posterior measures. And this can be achieved by, uh, I don't know about Gaussian priors in this case, without scaling them at least. Uh, as a function of the number of observations, but certainly uniform priors would satisfy this condition here that I'm that I'm highlighting, and of course the prior shouldn't rule out the true velocity field. In this case, and subject to these conditions on a on a on any weaker space, so we're our velocity field is coming from some h m m greater than zero, and for any h s for s less than m, the uh, posterior measures concentrate weakly on the true value of the parameter. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just make a few comments about this theorem, just some brief brief sketch and, 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 and sort of finish up. Um, compactness plays a crucial role in this proof. And I, and I think that's sort of also uh, the delicate role that the prior is playing here. It's a... Uh, uh, there, there are just a, a few scattered works. Uh, there's some nice recent work by Richard Nickel and an older paper by uh, Vollmer, but uh, there's very little on on this on this topic in general. And I think we have a strategy that could apply to a number of uh, PDE inversion problems. I think this is going to be upcoming work with a very nice PhD student that I have coming up here, which I'm feel, feeling very fortunate about. Um, so I think the approach somehow embedded in this is a sort of general approach with some specific things that we have to derive for advection diffusion equation. Um, but in kind of comparative perspective to other recent papers, I think we can say that there's much weaker assumptions on the forward map that is the parameter to solution. So in, in, in these other uh, aforementioned works, you need that the inverse map has some sort of Lipschitz continuity, and we're only requiring continuity in the way our proof is structured. Um, so, uh, well, uh, what one does is 
sort of identify where the large divisors are in the problem with this sort of uh, just naive use of the law of large numbers. And um, so one needs, one needs uniformity here. And basically the first task is to sort of recover the uh, true value of the theta, the theta or the so solution of the PDE. And that involves developing a sort of uniform version of the law of large numbers, so a parameter dependent version of the law of large numbers, which is the first place where compactness enters into the story. Um, and then we need to think about the, the, uh, the fact that, 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 in fact, our forward map is one to one. And uh, make use of a sim simple elementary bit of analysis, which played a very important role here, though, is that every continuous function on a uh, con continuous injective function, one to one function on a compact set has continuous uh, inverse but on a compact set. So this is a second use of compactness, which through Portmanteau's theorem uh, allows us to translate consistency in the theta field to consistency in the, um, in the, uh, in the velocity field in our problem. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and try not to uh, test your patience too much. So just to summarize, I think we have a you know, compelling methodology in these, in these Bayesian approaches to uh, estimate infinite dimensional unknown parameters in PDEs. I think it's very natural. I hope I've convinced you with uh, a few of the setups at the beginning that these are, these are good for fluid measurement problems. And we have tools, really tools in development. They, they, they need to be refined and better understood, but in these MCMC algorithms to resolve the posterior measures. I think consistency is a very exciting problem here, and there's a lot of there's a lot of good opportunities for very interesting analysis. Um, and I think with that, I'll wrap up here some references, and uh, uh, I guess I'll be a jerk and say just give a brief family update. Peter identified something on my <laughs> web page, so we're 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 doing good, and uh, uh, just because I've. It's really nice to see everybody, and I, 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 I really thank all of you for this, for this nice opportunity to uh, say hello. I hope I'll be able to do so in person, not so far in the future. Thank you.